Hi there, Adam Gower here, and welcome to this week's edition of the Gower Crowd podcast. And my guest this week is Ben Reinberg, who is not only a client of ours, but has become a good friend of mine. Since I met him some years ago, he has developed his own personal brand online. And he is by far one of the most proactive, creative, willing to try anything people I know in business. Really, really impressive. You'll find him very inspirational. He's very upbeat. He is one of the good guys. Of course, to find out more about Ben and his company, Alliance Consolidated Group of Companies, just go to the podcast page at gowercrowd.com. Of course, while you're there, be sure to sign up for our weekly newsletter. It's completely free, and we distribute updated news every week on the real estate syndication industry. All right, let's get on with it. Ben Reinberg of Alliance Consolidated Group of Companies. Here he is. Ben, super good to see you. It always is good to see you. Thank ben you. Ben Reinberg, I want to say, real estate mogul, social media influencer, medical office building guru. Ben, I've known you for a long time now. Tell, what is your story? Where did, I don't even know about all the way back to the beginning. Tell me your story. How did you get to where you are today? Well, first of all, Adam, what a privilege to be on your show. I've been waiting for years to come on. <laughs> and I finally arrived, folks. The fact that I am on Adam Gower's show is such a privilege. I've I've worked hard. I've had to climb mountains and hills and valleys in order to be on this show. And so I am going to enjoy every moment of it. And I really appreciate it, my friend. And I think this is the pinnacle of my show. So I'm going to stop. It, it, this is the last episode. I think you could just, I think you could bury me after this show because <laughs> this, is the, this is the, this is epic. And I'm really grateful. It's so good to see you, my friend. Thanks, just to man. give you audience my story. When I was in my early 20s, mm. <laughs> I've always been an entrepreneur. I tell this story when I was eight years old. Uh, I grew up in a small town in the Chicago area, and I grew up next to uh, uh, a area where it had the most bars per capita per square foot in the United States. And so there was a lot of drinking and smoking. Mm. And uh, so I found when I was eight years old, I used to sell cigarettes at a bar. I would break up cartons of Marlboro Reds and look at how to make money so I could buy Slurpees and, and, and candy at the local 7-Eleven by my house where I used to walk to that my father used to take me after his softball games. And, uh, and I've always worked since. And uh, in my early 20s, I started a business and I got into commercial real estate and I was influenced. I'm a CPA by trade. I worked in accounting for a year. I was miserable. I hate it. I was an audit and a billionaire influenced me out of New York to uh, become an entrepreneur. And uh, he said, you weren't much of, much of an accountant. And what he meant by that is he said, you're more of an entrepreneur and you should really consider that. And so I took that to heart, started my own business. Uh, mm. bought my first deal was an industrial deal in the Chicago area. Uh, in the first week, I lost 45% of the income in the building, retended it to a three tenant building. And long story short, sold it for a large multiple and that launched me. And then after uh, building millions of square feet of office and industrial, as well as syndicating numerous office, industrial and retail properties throughout the country, uh, mm. I sit here today uh, as the founder and CEO of Alliance Consolidated Group of Companies. We're headquartered in Chicago. I sit in my West Coast office in Newport Beach. We have wonderful people that work in the company and around the company. Uh, we have incredible marketing staff and uh, wonderful relationships around the around the country that help support our cause. And as you know, Adam, we just launched the brand new Alliance Medical Property Fund, which is taking off. We bought assets ready. We're continuing to raise money and uh, really excited about the growth. We've added people to our staff to support our growth. And we see a lot of opportunities forthcoming in this market. So that's who I am on, on, a, on a corporate real estate side. We launched my personal brand about right. 11 months ago, it's taking off. I have 104,000 followers on Instagram. Uh, everything else is taking off. Our Alliance Consolidated Social Media Campaign is growing as well with great people around us. And uh, and then my podcast, Ben Reinberg, I own it. We've had celebrities and ultra high net worth individuals coming on the show, and that's growing. And it's really exciting. And it all it all ties to help my company, my staff, my investors grow find great deals, build a better and larger equity base, 
And uh, I'm just really excited about the future. I'm in the prime of my career. You know, Adam, there's a statement in their career. You spend the first third of your career on your back, the second third on your stomach, and the last third on, I'm sorry, the excuse me, the first third on your back, the next third on your feet, and the last third on your stomach. I am on my stomach now, and I'm really grateful for all the people that have helped me get to this point. What I love about what I do, it's a marathon business, but it's also a growing business. As you age, it's like wine, and I collect wine. I'm a big wino is that you only get better with age in this business because you learn how to deal with failures, you fail forward, you learn how to engage and communicate and deal with people, you get involved in personal development to become the best version of yourself, and you become this person that you only can dream of. And it's happened in almost three decades I've been in this business. And so I'm just enjoying what I do. I get to work with people like you on a daily basis, which I'm grateful for. And life is good, my friend. It's just, it's just, I'm in a place where I'm just nothing but bliss every day because I get to meet incredible people from all walks of life. And now that I live in California, not in Chicago anymore, I don't have to deal with snow. I look out my window, I see blue skies and sun and beautiful people and, and there's no potholes on the streets. So I'm just very grateful for where I am right now. You're but, not living in my area of California. <laughs> I'll tell you that. I mean, here in LA, uh, there are only potholes in the street. But let me ask you about, let's spin back to that first commercial real estate deal that you did. What were the lessons that you learned out of that, that you carry forward with you to today? You know what the biggest lesson I learned was there's no such thing as can't. There's no such thing as a contraction like, I can't do this. I shouldn't do this. I wouldn't do this. It's more about how can I do it? And, and what came out of that was there was a lot of lessons, which I'm very grateful for. How do you deal with adversity? How do you become resource rich and find resources? How do you believe in yourself to deal with challenges? How do you sell a deal? One of the things I learned in that deal, which was priceless today, was we had to replace the roof when we were selling it. And I sold it. I was the broker record. And I'm, I'm not typically a broker. I don't sell my deals. I don't get involved in brokerage in my career. But this one I did to understand the process because I was still learning at a young age. And what I learned was if you let your buyers know the train's coming. And what I mean by that is we had to replace the roof in that deal. And so what I did is we used Argus at the time, a software to model cash flows, which is what Argus is about. If your audience doesn't know what that is, it's a cash flow assumption program. And so what happened was the roof was say $250,000 to replace. It was an industrial roof. It was a flat roof. It was aged. It was 20 years old. Excuse me. And what we did, Adam, was we modeled it in Argus. And we told the buyer, look, model this in your in your numbers. Why? Build rapport. Let them know. It was going to come up anyways. There's no doubt. They were going to go through due diligence. They were going to say, we want a credit. Mm -hmm. I told it to them up front. So when you tell it to them up front, guess what? No one retrades you. Mm -hmm. Okay. You build credibility, you build reports. Like these guys are honest guys. They're telling us you got to replace the roof. Great. Guess what? You get a higher price. You get a, a maybe a faster due diligence. You get a buyer that's aligned with you to achieve your goals as well. And I learned that at a young age. And so whenever we sell or however we do business, integrity is everything. And so there were so many valuable lessons that came out of that first deal that that I are priceless that carry with me today about what integrity means, what transparency means, how to be consistent, how to deal with adversity and be persistent. And what also I learned a lot was I had a lot to learn at a young age. I had to, I had to really grow my expertise. And what's interesting about that deal is the four core values that Alliance and all my employees live by is transparency, integrity, consistency, and expertise. And everyone that works for me has to adhere by those values. That first deal that I did produced all those lessons that carry with me a day. And that's what that first deal did for me. And you also, you did, uh, you, you said that you did ground up development as well. Yes. So it's not yeah. something you do today, but tell me about, and it's actually where my ex, my career started financing ground up multifamily. Mm -hmm. uh, but what, what was your, um, like, describe the difference between ground up and, and value add and what you're doing today and, well, and why you kind of migrated away from that. Yeah, I, I think one, there was a lot of there was a lot of risk in development risk if you didn't have a tenant in hand. A lot of what we did was project management and development. 
And so when you do like a single tenant industrial building, you have a tent in hand, it's a lot easier to do a ground up development. It doesn't mean we couldn't do it or wouldn't do it, but it's just takes away from our core business existing assets right now and adding value to our existing assets. However, when we're developing and, and doing build the suits, what would end up happening was uh, we would have a tent in hand, we'd go find land, we'd entitle the land, we'd figure out where they want to be, we'd draw concentric circles where their employees were wanted to be, we'd look at the top level executive, the C-level executives, and find out where they lived so we could find the best location. So we would procure the land, we would, we would tie up the land, we would go design the square footage they want based on the land, my land they wanted. And we'd go to town and we'd do a dog and pony show. We'd bring in three or four or five different general contractors in our office. We'd bid it out, do a competitive bid. We'd pick it with the tenant and then we go and build a building. And yeah. either we would end up buying it and doing sale lease back. They would buy it. Um, you know, it was all different. It depend on the situation. And ben, so you so, but sorry, just to interrupt, but you um you alluded to this before. This is some sophisticated uh construction and development that you're describing. Did you have any mentors? Can you describe kind of how I, mentors have helped you or how you've learned the, the ropes over the years? Um, I've had a lot of mentors over the years, and I, I, I'm a big believer in asking for help because I don't have all the answers, Adam, and I'm very vulnerable in front of people. I'm not afraid to tell people I don't know. And that's been a big component of my career to propel me to this point of I'm still learning. I learn every day, and I encourage your audience out there, never stop learning, never stop asking questions, never, never stop being vulnerable in front of people. So when I was younger, I realized, I said, okay, there's no internet. So the only way I'm going to learn is tapping into people older than me. They could have been brokers, other principals, guys we're buying from. Um, my first deal that I mentioned from you, I bought from two icons in the business in Chicago that were worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And guess what? <clears throat> I'd ask some questions even because after I bought the property and what was interesting about that first deal to go back was they brought me in their conference room and I'm wearing a suit and I'm young. And they're sitting me in a, and they have their assistant come in and she comes in with the China saying, would you like coffee or tea? And, you know, and, and, and water. And I'd sit and they say, here, sit here. And uh, I said, where are they sit? They'll, they'll sit over. Don't worry about it. They'll come in. And these guys were in their late fifties at the time, very successful. And, uh, and they made me wait 45 minutes to let me sweat. And they, turn, <laughs> they turned up the heat in the room. Did they really actually yeah, literally in front of you? I had turned up the heat in the room. I could tell. <laughs> I remember it vividly. And I'm sweating. I'm wearing a tie, sweating through my shirt. Uh -huh. They they come in and 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 they sit at the end of the table far away. They're like, So uh, how old are you, Ben? And I told them how old I was. And they said, uh, what makes us think that you should you can close this deal? And I said, because I got the capital right, I got my loan ready to go. I got a term sheet I brought with me. First Bank of Holland Park's doing the loan. How'd you get the loan? Oh, my godfather works on the board, but I got it. Don't worry about it. What about equity? How are you going to do it? I'm almost done with my equity raise. Really? Yep. Okay. Uh, what do you want? I want a credit. Here are the issues. And I went through it with them. I showed them backup documentation. And they said, you got a lot of nerve coming in here asking for a credit. You know, even though they knew I was right, because I had conversations 10, 15, 20 years later after this deal. And they laugh about it. And they laugh about what they did to me. And they said, we've never seen a kid like you with so much guts. And, and, uh, and after we closed, they, uh, they both called me. And they said, you know what? You got, you got a great career ahead of you, kid. That's what they call me, kid. You got a great career ahead of you, kid. I said, why do you say that? They said, because you know what? You handled yourself well. You had integrity. You told us exactly what you needed to do and you did it. Everything you said you did, you did mm. and you closed. And that's, that's a sign of someone that's going to be successful that can get a deal done. This was an easy deal. We know it. And, uh, and we think it's great. And if you ever need anything, let us know. And that, oh, that conversation opened the door for confidence and the ability to ask and tap into them as mentors. And so I used it, I used oh. it for whatever time and that propelled me. So I've had numerous mentors uh, over the year, at, over the years, Adam, in all different aspects of my life, personal and professionally, different types of businesses, um, commercial real estate, 
uh, attorneys, accountants, um, the list goes on and on. I would not be sitting in the seat I'm in today if I didn't have all these people that gave me guidance, love, and support to become the Ben Reinberg I am today. And it's why one of the things I want to do is give back because I think it's so important to help others. And it's what how I grew up in the business from people that helped me. And it realized like there's people out there struggling that don't, we're in a very sophisticated business, Adam. Mm -hmm. And it's nice if you can give someone a helping hand to get them higher on the learning curve. Now you are today focused on medical office buildings. Tell me about how you got to medical office buildings from industrial. It's a, it's a great question. Well, I thought I was going to be an office, general office maven. There was a guy in Chicago named Sam Zell, who I always idolize. And I said, I want to be the next him. Eventually he's getting older. I think I could do it. So I started buying office campuses and I realized that the margins on office campuses are shrinking. It's not the best asset class, especially in 08 and 09. I really learned the hard way. And so 18 years ago, we took a step back and we talked to our investors and said, you know, the internet's becoming prevalent, not really bullish on retail. Um, we saw some changes in industrial, the institutions are buying it up and, and the yields are too low, especially in Chicago and some of the port cities, the 24 hour cities around the country. What should we look at? Well, medical was being debated in our country at the time about, are we going to socialize medicine? What's going on with healthcare? How, how are we gonna deal with social security? There was so much turmoil around healthcare. We said, the human body's never going out of style. If we stick with healthcare, we will always win. So we made that decision 18 years ago. And mm -hmm. long story short, our track record is 24% IRR on medical properties. We've done a lot of deals. And we understand that niche and there's high barriers to entry to get up the learning curve on all the different niches in medical and how it works. And so we've had tremendous success in medical. And so we did that because our investors were saying, well, what would produce stable cash flow? Because we can't predict higher hours in this market at the time we started buying it. And uh, ever since we've gotten hooked on it and we believe in it and it's a passion of mine. And uh, I'm really proud of all the people at Alliance throughout the years that have helped us get to this point. Well, everything you've said so far is eternal, I'm glad to say. Uh, but I'm going to ask you, I'm going to date stamp this podcast and ask you, here we are, April uh, 2023. What are the biggest, all kinds of things, wacky things going on in the market and the economy? So in the context of what's going on today, what are the biggest challenges that you see? And, and I'm going to, I have a follow-up question as well. Um, couple things. Obviously, liquidity with banks is a challenge. Banks are tightening up a little bit, but you got to be creative. And they want to deal with folks like us with a lot of experience, which benefits us in a market like this. That's the advantage we have. Uh, also, deals. The way pricing of deals has been challenging because uh, cap rates are still fairly low, but they're starting to tick up and adjust. And we're going to see that over the next period, a handful of months that we'll start seeing buying opportunities. We're starting to, some of the challenges we see is people being able to refinance and getting the value. So for example, there might be loans coming due and you got to go get appraised. Well, guess what? If you're in a market where market rents have compressed, let's say you're at $29 and market rents 21, your value is going to drop. And so the appraiser is going to go out and all of a sudden, like your LTV covenants and your loan are going to change. So what ends up happening, you become in a negotiation with your lender. So you're going to see some of that. You're going to see people turning over the keys. You're going to see more sales to, to get rid of bad debt or debt that's not panning out. And we see that's what's going to be happening in this market shortly. So there will be buying opportunities. Unfortunately, there will be people struggling out there as well. But uh, it's just the ability to hold game. That's the key of commercial real estate. And so uh, we see opportunities. We see a little bit of struggling going on. We see uh, values compressing. And uh, in, in certain areas, there's leasing activity. Other areas, you know, it's been slow. And what about opportunities? I mean, again, you've kind of alluded to what those are. But where do you see opportunities throughout the rest of, uh, of the year, next uh, six, nine months? I see there's going to be opportunities going directly to sellers and finding out how you can help them. And finding out where their where their pain points are, what what's going on with them, they have to refinance. Would it be easier just to sell, uh, sell leasebacks to raise cash because they get camp financing? 
from their lenders. And so, Adam, we see opportunities abound where it's going to be all different types of situations. But again, these are the moments where you put those extra hours in uh, into your workday. These are the moments you take advantage of. There's, there is the most wealth building that's going to happen over the next 24 months. And these are the moments you take advantage of and take them serious. You double down on staff. You double down on your time. You put that extra 10 minutes in. You make that extra call. You make that extra email if you have to. You know, there's a lot of power to putting in a little bit more effort. And uh, if you do it, I could assure you, you'll see great success. Mm -hmm. I love when there's chaos in the market because basically what it means is there's opportunity. Yes. <clears throat> now you're also, you're doing, since I've known you, how long has it been? So it's almost a year. I mean, it's been a while already, but uh, you- uh, and, and I think it's been a couple of years. It's been, a, yeah, it's been a while. I mean, it's, exactly. But how do you, how are you building your, how are you changing Alliance? to accommodate the changes in the market? Because I know you're doing a lot. We just announced, um, we're doing a couple of things. One, we're adding staff. We're beefing up our acquisition and our investor relations department, our property management department to prepare for the future and our growth and scale. Mm. But one of the things we're doing, which is unique, is we've always been a people first initiative company. And soon forthcoming, we're doing some things where we've realized that our employees' personal lives and business lives come together as one. Mm -hmm. And so we said, wouldn't it be great if we understood and can understand where our employees' personal visions are, what they want to achieve, what their personal goals are, um, what they're, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're looking at um, how they define their perfect day. We're looking at what their perfect needs are and, and look at, you know, their personal motivations. Um, we figure out what energizes them, what drains them. And so we're going through these processes that we bring in people to help to say, how can we align your personal goals and what you're trying to achieve in your life and what you want to be and do and put you first as a people first company that we are and align it to where the company wants to go and, and figure out how to help these people. So we're doing a lot of personal development within the company. And what that's going to do is provide a well-rounded life for our employees where they feel empowered and they feel part of a, of a mission on a personal level and professional level. And that's something that a lot of people don't do. It's something that I've taken a step back to say, how do I change the paradigm? How do I make this the best culture? How do I make it where it's a lifestyle for someone and they can enjoy what they do and create longevity and wealth for each one of my employees? And so we said, we get, we said, this has to be about them so we can create a better us. And so what we're doing is we're bringing in top-notch people to uh, change the paradigm and show people how much we care about them, which eventually will build an incredible culture and help us achieve the mission we want in the next few years. Related to that, how would you describe your management style? Um, What's well, evolved over the years? You know, mm. I'm now I'm now a big delegation guy. I don't like to micromanage. I like to bring in good people and say, go ahead and run with it. Mm. Uh, I step in when I need to. We have a leadership team now that has certain responsibilities and KPIs to to achieve. And either you're on board and you're on the miss mission and and you want to do what we do, or else you're just not a fit. And so it's interesting the dynamic of work life has changed with this remote learning and the pandemic where we have a lot of people working remotely and they become like a widget. You know, it used to be, we, Adam, we used to have an office in Chicago and right. everyone was in the office. There was an osmosis that went on. People would come to my office, we'd joke around, we'd have fun, we'd do company lunches and outings and everything. It's not that we don't do company outings, but it's like one of the things that the pandemic showed us, and especially this remote wor working is, the uh, the missing piece was the human connection. We are all social beings. We like to connect to each other. I miss shaking someone's hand. I miss giving them a hug. I miss smiling. I miss the smell in the office. I miss I miss the camaraderie, the joking around. Uh, you know, grabbing a cup of coffee with someone and having a a deep conversation, talking about what happened this weekend, how you doing. 
the human connection to me is the biggest thing that has been lost in this whole thing. And what I always strive for in this new world that we live in is how do we bring back that human connection? How do we bring back that personal touch? So we've had to change a lot of our ways of how to do things. And part of that is it's unfortunate, but it just seems like everyone's a widget now based on KPIs and there's no human element to it. There's no emotion to it. It's more like either you perform or you're out. And it's why you see a lot of job hopping. It's why you see uh, people aren't happy or satisfied. I can't imagine what it's like to work at home. I work in an office here in, in Newport Beach. And I'll tell you something. I am very bullish. And I tell my employees this. If you want to rent an office, go ahead and do it. Get a shared office. Get out in the world and deal with people and engage with them. Because us as human beings need that interaction. When you are in a locked room by yourself and you got the dog barking or you got your wife or significant other or you're by yourself or maybe you have kids running around, it's great. And don't get me wrong, it's convenient. And it's a great, it's a great commute. Okay. Especially <laughs> from Chicago. I know what commuting's like. However, you miss that interaction. We as humans need to be socially connected to each other. And it's one of the biggest things I see that was the downfall of the pandemic. People were working from home and wearing pajamas and growing their beards and 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 a lot of drinking was going on at home. And we were essential business. I was back in the office in two months. I was struggling to work at home, Adam. And the reason why is because I like to be connected with people. I like to see people. I like to engage people. Um, I love that interaction. And now that we're back in an office and I get to be in California, there's nothing better. And I know that as we run our business, we're encouraging everyone to get out there and engage with people because I know deep down that's what people want. And no one wants to be stuck in a room in their house. It's It sounds great, especially when it's February in Chicago and it's zero degrees. Yeah, it's nice. But you know what? It doesn't serve you. And so we learn that. And we're always trying to figure out how to improve the human experience at Alliance. Well, now you've mentioned it a few times and uh, it can't just have been for the weather. So why the move to California? That's a big thing. You know, Chicago lad all your life and yes. suddenly uh the, the i was uh being a cpa i was trying to figure out how i could pay more taxes <laughs> so, exactly i said what state can i go <laughs> where can i go <laughs> where i can pay more put a pit on california I said sign me up it's kind of like jed clampett and the beverly hillbilly saying That's oh, hilarious. so um <laughs> no in all seriousness i have i have two sons at usc one uh Ah. One is graduating in uh, about three weeks. He's going to walk the ceremony. He already graduated, but, and I'm really proud of him and he should be proud of himself. And so mm -hmm. he'll, he'll be in the real world shortly. I'm excited for him. My Probably going to move back to Chicago. You know? No, I think he'll be, <laughs> I think he'll be in LA if he gets a job. We'll see. He's got some strong interest in him. So really bright guy. And uh, he's an amazing kid. And then my middle son um, is in engineering at Viterbi at USC. So I have two boys at USC. Mm -hmm. And then my daughter is in high school in Orange County. And so we bought a house um, uh, in Orange County uh, about three years ago. And I was commuting back and forth from Chicago for a year and a half. Right. A year ago from yesterday is when I moved officially permanently to California. Oh, it's been a great transition. I've been here for about a year now permanently. I'm not doing the commute anymore. And I really appreciate it. I enjoy the people out here. Uh, the food is not as good as Chicago. However, the people are wonderful. Uh, the weather is great. And, uh, and I'm thrilled and, and it helps my personal brand. It helps the company and our growth. And uh, I love waking up to the sunshine. There's nothing better than smiling, seeing the sun shine on you. And, uh, so yeah, it was family oriented and, uh, and it was also the ability to say, Hey, I'm in a different area and different opportunities with investors and deals. And we do a lot of business now on the West coast. So I love it. I can jump on a plane in 45 minutes. I could be in any city on the West coast. And so that's helpful. Um, but it's a different, it's a different world. It's different lifestyle. It's the Midwest is a lot different than California, but, uh, I, I really enjoy it. Now, you and I have been working together on uh, the Alliance brand mm -hmm. and on uh, the uh, medical office building syndications. 
But you also have a personal brand, don't you? And uh, yes. tell, tell me about that. What was the, what was the origin of wanting to do that? I, in fact, I remember when you started that. Yeah. So long ago, it's really exploded, hasn't it? It's amazing. So, yeah. So one of my mentors said to me, um, he encouraged me. He said, uh, "You really should do a personal brand." And I said, "What does that mean?" And he's like, "You gotta get on the platforms and add value because if you if your mission is to help people, Ben." Cause that was what we determined what I love to do. He said, you gotta get on social media and build your personal brand so you can get out there. People know who you are and build credibility. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I said, okay. And he goes, and you got to reveal everything about you. And I said, everything, he said, everything. I said, okay, how we get this started. He goes, I suggest you do a podcast and, uh, I'll introduce you to someone and they'll help you launch it. And, May 31st of 2022 will be our first annual anniversary of the podcast. So we launched Ben Reinberg, I Own It. And I Own It is owning every aspect of your life. And to date, we've brought on celebrities, high profile people, ultra high net worth individuals, and it is taken off. And so we've had people like Phil Hellmuth and Natasha Graziano and, uh, uh, just incredible talented people list goes on and on. you can go on any uh a podcast platform and see it you can go on youtube we're all over people go to ben reinberg they can see all the social media platforms on on and follow who i am reinberg.com yes and so uh and also i realized with the personal brand it promotes my company alliance and it helps my employees and my leadership team it helps us find resources it builds brand awareness I go on podcasts as a guest as well. So I'm able to promote the new fund. I'm able to promote what we do. And it's a wonderful, wonderful platform to be able to promote not only myself, but also to promote what I'm trying to achieve in life, but also to help my, my company alliance and what we're trying to do in our mission. And so uh, the personal brand has been great. Our following has grown significantly. We have a wonderful group of people that handle not only my personal brand, we also have a staff that handles my company's social media, which has been inspiring to me. So we have this holistic approach between my personal brand and the company's brand to come together to be able to provide value, not only to the public, but also to my investors. And uh, I'm really excited about it. I'm really grateful that we've gotten to this point. And uh, I'm really excited for the remainder of 2023 to see what we have to, to, to do with it and how it's going to help people. So you've been talking to some pretty impressive people on your podcast uh, without pointing any names. I'm sure everybody, I, I know all of them have contributed something significant, but what, what stands out? What have been kind of the lessons that you've learned or surprises you've had from talking to your guests? I get these aha moments mm. sometimes when I'm talking to guests and a lot. It happens frequently where almost every interview of like, I need to do that for myself. I need to do that for Alliance. We should be implementing that. Or or I use the lessons I learned and I teach it in, internally into my company. The other thing I learned was how amazing is it to network with these wildly talented, successful people? Yeah. I get them one-on-one, -on -one, I get their contact information, and I get to connect with them on a personal level for an hour and even afterwards or beforehand. Mm -hmm. And where can you find that in life? I can't pick up the phone and call some of these high profile people and say, Hey, you want to grab a cup of coffee? Right. And they're going to say, who are you? Right. Instead, the podcast builds credibility and my credibility and they come on the show and it's like, we know each other and then we exchange information and then the re relationship takes it from there. Now and your, your, your so guests, or, do they all come to your studio, Ben? Or, or do you do some of them uh, remotely? Well, it's, well, it's both. I only do. Yeah. Right? So, so most, so I would say a certain percentage is remotely and a certain percentage is in studio. It seems oh. as the podcast grows, we're doing more and more in studio, which I love the in studio, Adam, because mm -hmm. again, we go back to we're social creatures and we need to engage with each other. Mm -hmm. The interview is such a different energy when they're in person. It becomes really, really deep mm -hmm. um, because mm -hmm. virtual, it's great but we're on a screen and they're wonderful shows, but there's nothing better than in person in person. It's, 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 there's a lot of love going in the room. There's engagement. Uh, there's comfort level. We have comfortable chairs and microphones and great lighting. 
and it's in Laguna Beach, California, which there's nothing better to spend a little time right. Right at the beach and hanging out. And it's a great studio. And uh, I love it. And the guests love it too. And it's, there's something about it. It's that connection of in-person that's just mm -hmm. priceless. So Ben, I have two questions. They're the same question. I'm going to ask them both anyway. What drives you, comma, what gets you out of bed in the morning? You know what gets me out of bed in the morning mm -hmm. is I'm striving to become the best version of myself and trying to figure out who that is. Mm -hmm. That's what gets me out of bed. Uh, I also... What gets me out of bed is I never forget that tw early 20 year old kid that started this journey, what I had to do to get here. And when I reflect back and I look back at them, at what that means, and, and you remember the grind and how hard it is and what you do, I don't take it for granted. I'm grateful for all the people I've met and, and the deals I've done and the engagement and the lessons I've learned and the knowledge I've, I've acquired over the years. That's what gets me out of bed. That's what drives me. And also what drives me is I am looking to see people in my company become wildly successful like me and change their lives and impact them and give back. And I get a lot of gratitude and, and, and a lot of gratification to see people at Alliance flourish and live the life of their dreams. You know, there's a metric that I, that I would live and see as I've grown in business is how many kids have I put through college that have worked for me? And the numbers are astounding. And that's a stat I'm very mm. proud of, because you know why? That mm. means I'm doing the right thing and I'm impacting people and helping people and grow their families. And so it's those little things. It's the mm. given nature of me. You know, um, one of my mentors said to me, um, and God rest his soul, he said, he said, don't give your best do whatever it takes. And I hear that voice in my head that he says to me. And when I think about it, that's what it means to get up. You know, when you're tired, that's when you got to do things. I work out with a trainer every day during the work week. I'm blessed I could do that. And you know why? That's, my, that's part of my morning routine is, again, I don't forget where I came from. I want to be healthy. I want to be able to give as much to not only my family, but everyone that's a part of Alliance internally or externally. And to be the best version of myself, I gotta be healthy. So guess what? I have a responsibility to people and I take that serious, Adam. And by doing so, what ends up happening is I'm motivated. I get up, I go work out, I get in the office, I add value. And people say to me like, why do you work, Ben? You don't have to work. You don't have to work so hard. Why not get a 10 or 11? Because you know why? That's not what an example, that's not what a leader does a leader sets examples where he doesn't have to speak his actions speak for his words and that's how i live my life and uh i don't need to tell people how wonderful ben reinberg is i show people how wonderful ben reinberg is there's a difference and i encourage anyone out there listening is that use your actions to speak for themselves you know and that's how i live my life adam and i lead and i care and i'm a very empathetic person. I care about the people around me and, and helping them. And by doing that, that's what motivates me to get up and, and get at it. Because uh, I feel that if I lead by example, and my staff and my employees and leadership team knows, man, this guy gets up at 4.30 every day. He meditates, he stretches, he works out. He has no excuses. He, okay. What kind of impact does that put on my employees? Because that says to them, if the guy if the guy who doesn't need to do it, do it. What excuse do we have? And it inspires them to become better versions of themselves. And that's what a leader does. You do things when you don't have to do it. No one has to ask. Because I'll be honest with you, during my whole career, no one said to me, Ben, go work out. No one said, Ben, you got to show up to work. It came from here. And so that's what I lead by. And that's what I do. And that's what inspires me. And when I do all this, it inspires others and it fulfills me. Because for a while, Adam, I was trying to, I was chasing happiness. And I realized that I wasn't receiving it. I couldn't find it because my environment wasn't changing. But I woke up one day and I realized if I'm happy, my environment will change. And so I started working on myself and realizing that's how I can improve as a person. That's interesting. So 
And so for me, life is a, is a battle. It doesn't matter how successful I am. It doesn't matter uh, how the accolades. It doesn't matter the awards. I look at my career and I look, and people say, well, how do you define success? I define it by how many people have I impacted? How many people have I helped? How many lives have I changed? And how much knowledge and what did I do in this society to help people grow and become the version that they want to? Because that's my legacy. And guess what happens? From all that behavior and actions, money attracts that behavior. The universe rewards me for that type of actions. And so I don't worry about money. I worry about how am I treating other people and creating impact and serving. So this is, again, I don't want these to sound <clears throat> too similar, these questions, but it's different when you're talking to your children. What are the lessons you would like your children to learn from you? What are the most likely? It's a great question because someone said to me a long time ago, your kids are watching you. Mm. Words don't matter. And so I want my kids to see what a work ethic looks like. I want to see like how they need to work to achieve success. I want them to understand that they can do whatever they want in life if they roll up their sleeves and put the work in. I want them to learn what integrity is. I want them to learn of how to develop themselves into the best parts of society that they can. And I can't do that from words. I got to do that from my actions. And, uh, and so that's part of my social media campaign. Hmm. And uh, I think my kids think I'm pretty damn cool, Adam. You know, that dad's on social media and he's kicking ass. I actually <laughs> wasn't going to say it's, just but it's, but it, Well, I go to my kids' school. I got to tell you this. I go to my kids' school. Uh-huh. And they have events and all the kids turn around. I get I get a, a round of applause. I don't know. Why. Uh, <laughs> it's like two or three of the popular kids like to watch my podcast again. Cool. Yeah. And it so, is cool. He's like 12 years old. It's the funnest thing. So I'll like, walk you in a room and they'll be like, oh, the real Ben Reinberg's here. They'll tease yeah, me. Right. Exactly. But, but uh uh but you know what? It yeah. it makes them proud that their dad's out there hustling. It makes them proud to say, hey, you know, dad works hard. He gets up at the crack of dawn. Yeah, he's traveled a lot. Yeah, but he's didn't he's done this because he provides us a lifestyle that he never had. And that was my goal for my kids when I was when we were raising them, is you know, I said to my wife at the time, I said, I said, uh, I'm gonna do things differently. I'm gonna create a lifestyle that they've never had. And I want you to have the same lifestyle too. And it was important. I was on a mission. And that's what I've done for my kids. And that's all through my actions. So I want them to understand the value of the dollar, which I do. I teach them various lessons about money and how it works. I teach them lessons how to treat people. Uh, I teach them what hard work looks like. You know, I say to my kids, when you get a job, be the first one in, the last one to leave. I explain to them why. Mm -hmm. So I'm able to share all the knowledge and lessons that I've learned in life with them. And that's priceless because when I was growing up, my parents didn't have all these lessons I've learned. It's different when you're an entrepreneur, you're really on the front lines and you get hit in the face with a lot of, a lot of failure, a lot of lessons, a lot of hard knocks, a lot of lessons, a lot of just resources that teach you and mentors. And I've been so fortunate to have great people riding shotgun with me throughout this whole career so far. And I've been able to bleed that into my kids. So they learn and I let my action speak for my, for my words and it's done a lot of good. And I could tell my kids are phenomenal parts of society. The fact they go to wonderful schools, they have great grades, they're kind people, they're disciplined, um, and they're all going to be wildly successful, probably more than me. And I looked at it as a sign to me and my wife and the hard work and the effort that's gone in. And I, and I think that, uh, it's a, uh, it's it's a it's an interesting dynamic, but it's works, and they're going to be incredibly talented. I'm excited over the next ten to twenty years to see how they mature and develop in the workforce. And and again, those are the lessons that I've learned: is how can I share with them what I've learned about parenting, but also uh, the lessons I've learned at Alliance throughout the years. And they've watched me; they watched me blossom. They watched the personal brand blossom the podcast and i don't really talk about much with it i just let them 
watch and see and let them learn from it. And, uh, and one day I'll hear from them and say, no, dad, good job. You know, way to go. Cause they see it's hard. It's hard to make a living. It's hard to create success. Mm. And when they see dad doing it, it inspires them. I always said that I never wanted to handcuff my kids. I want them to go to the best schools if they can. I want them to have the best opportunities and I want them to be able to live their dreams just like their father has. And I felt that who am I to tell anyone that they can't be an entrepreneur and they can't live the life of their dreams and go for whatever they want in life. So I don't handcuff them. I let them be the people they are. I don't think there are anyone's going to get into commercial real estate, um, which is fine with me. I own that and I'm okay with it. I want what's best for them. And I think all the things I've been through has created this DNA and natural osmosis that has carried into them so they can live an incredible life as they get older. Beautiful, Ben. I can't believe, uh, I just noticed the time. It seems uh, only like a few minutes that we've been talking about. We're actually fast approaching an hour already. It's unbelievable. Uh, let me uh, ask you three, what I call rapid fire sign off questions. All right, I'm ready. The first of the three mm -hmm. is what are your daily habits? What are the daily habits that you have that make you successful? Uh, I wake up and I meditate for uh, anywhere from uh, 18 to 36 minutes a day. I do some stretching and then uh, I get ready and I go train with my trainer, Andrew, and we go at it hard. And uh, he's a wonderful person and he's taught me a lot. And, uh, and then uh, I get ready and then I go into the office and I get in the office and meet with my staff or whatever I need to at the time. Sometimes I have meetings lined up and, uh, and I start my work day. And, uh, and then hopefully in the middle of the day, I do some more meditation around noon and go for a walk, grab some lunch, keep finishing my day. Uh, and I'm pulled, Adam, into a tremendous amount of meetings, especially Zoom meetings and te Microsoft Teams meetings where uh, and multiple, multiple in a row. And, uh, and I get to engage with our staff from around the country. And then uh, I go home and enjoy dinner or do, do whatever or have dinner and, uh, or a meeting for dinner. And then uh, I uh, just kind of wind down. And because uh, of different time zones being in California, sometimes I have later calls, sometimes not. And then I wind down. I'm not a TV guy. I don't watch TV, rarely. Um, I read. Uh, and before I go to bed, I'll journal, I'll meditate, mm -hmm. and uh, and then I go to sleep, and then I start it all over again. And it's just my routine. It's what I love and and who I am. And so I'm a big routine people person, mm -hmm. and uh, I feel that it keeps me emotionally balanced to do what I want and achieve my mission. So I'm extremely disciplined. Uh, I'm not your typical person. Uh, I am. I try to be in bed by a certain time. I try to get enough sleep. Uh, I am adamant about sleep. I do whatever I can to get the best sleep in the world. And what time do you go to bed? Because I know that you and I, when we speak, it's usually around 6, 6 a.m. Yeah. yeah. And so I try to get to bed if I can by 9. That's my goal. Yeah, me too. Uh, when I, I'm, I'm so glad to hear somebody else say that. When I, go, I was the only lunatic that did that and gets yeah, up. When I, when I go bad later, I, I'm laughing <laughs> because I know that I have to get up early, you know, 4 30, 5 o'clock in the morning. Well, that's the thing. If even if you go to bed late, you still wake up at that time and you lose. Right. And, and I'm not getting my full 78 hours. And, right. and and I'm talking about great sleep. Mm. And so I've realized that I have a responsibility to everyone. And why am I screwing around if I go to bed at 11? It's why it's also, even though I collect wine, okay, and I love wine, I barely drink at them. It's rare. Mm. I have a glass of wine anymore. I stopped drinking. I do not take in caffeine. I'll drink decaf tea if I want something hot. Mm. Um, I drink a ton of water. Uh, one of my new things is I am big into spring water uh, with minerals and electrolytes. Mm. And I'm always searching for the fountain of youth and the, and the golden egg to stay young and feel young. And so I take good care of myself. I eat healthy. Um, I'm 53 years old. I'm in great shape. You don't look it. And uh, yeah, you might have done. You might have done 10 years ago. Yes. So so. Count, totally. So 
So for me, it's it's just uh, staying healthy and and prioritizing. And because everyone set, everyone makes excuses. Why am I not wealthy? Why am I? Why can't I not start a business? <clears throat> why am everything is why 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 and excuses? It's because you're not accountable to yourself. You don't love yourself enough. It's all, you're always worried about what other people think. I don't care what other people think. It's like when Ben Reimer's guy go to bed, I'm going to bed. Because you know what? You're not in my body and you're not living my life. And you don't have the responsibility of the stress or the headaches I might have. Exactly. And so <clears throat> I've learned that throughout the years, I control my own destiny. I've done things, Adams, that people don't understand. I did a video on social media about going into the office on Saturday because I'm hungry. And it went viral. It was a huge video because I'm hungry still. And I'm not talking about food. I'm talking about deals and equity and, and, and creating success for my staff and, and leadership team. And what I realized was I'm going to make decisions that aren't popular. Going out on Saturday, I shot, we shot content for the company Saturday and Sunday last week, which was huge. And it was really important to me to meet my videographer. And so we did that. And you know what? It's not popular. Who wants to go in their office on a Sunday? It's California. Surfing capital of the world I live in. There's there's water, <laughs> there's blue skies. I, I'm across from Fashion Now and there's there's gorgeous people walking around. There's sun and 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 I could drive my car and just enjoy life and let the wind flow through my hair. And I'm in the office on Sunday grinding. And so I do things differently. I I don't. I don't accept mediocrity in my life, Adam. And so I've learned that it's not popular all the time. But you know what? It's what I enjoy. It's what I, I, I achieve my goals. And I never want to have to ever worry. And so for me, um, I go that extra mile for everyone and for myself. And so part of that is, you know, one someone on my staff, she said to me, she said to me something, I, I guess it's a compliment. She said, you're the most available CEO I've ever met. And she's uh, a little bit younger than me, just a hair. Mm -hmm. And and I said, what do you mean? She goes, you just give. You keep giving. She goes, I'm worried about you because I'd like to see you take more time off. But I know that's not going to happen because I know your personality. And I know when you are taking time off, you're not really taking time off because you care. She goes, one day you will. I said, of course. One day I'll wind down. But uh, eventually we'll get there. But uh, yeah, I'm available. And I learned, you know, one of my friends, Greg Reed, I love him, love him so much. He was on my show as a guest and he's in, uh, he's in Carlsbad. And he said to me, the most successful people are the most available people. And I kind of took, I was like, wow, that sounds like me, that I'm available. And he's right. You make time to be available because you're successful and you understand it and you want to put in a little bit extra time if you have to get something done. That's what was meant by it. And so it's a, uh, it's a beautiful thing. Um, second of my, these are quick fire questions. Okay. <laughs> just <laughs> on and on. I think it's because our relationship, we talk so much. It's just like, an <laughs> I know, exactly. But keep going. Right, so but you know it's fun. i like having these because you can break these up afterwards they, they uh, make good sound bites this could be okay hardest lesson learned in real estate what's the hardest lesson you've learned um hardest lesson i learned was how to create the ability to hold the key to commercial real estate is the ability to hold ability to hold ability to hold and understanding what that means and once i really understood it it kind of changed my career path to hold to hold, to be able to hold the property, ride it through different cycles. Ah, to hold. Right. So the hardest lesson is... It's the Chicago accent. Yeah, exactly. But the hardest lesson is what, though? Is, is it too well, much it's, debt or what it's, exactly? It's, it's over leveraging properties, I've learned. Yeah. Uh, I did that once on a deal and it didn't serve me. This is when I was younger. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I've learned that uh, treat people the way you want to be treated. I've learned the, one of the lessons I've learned is become a great listener, but not only a great listener, seek the truth in what someone's telling you was a great lesson I learned. Adam, there are so many lessons I've learned that have been so impactful on my career. I mm -hmm. could probably write a book about the lessons. You should. I Maybe I should. I, but by the way, I am writing a book. It's going to be coming out October 1st. I'm really excited. We're working on it. So oh, stay, cool. Stay tuned. What, what, 
What's it about? Uh, it's going to it's going to be about commercial real estate. It's going to have some mindset. It's going to be about leadership too, and uh, it's going to be really exciting. So we started working on it a week ago, and uh, the genesis is here, and it's going to keep going. So I'm looking forward to it. Last question. So for somebody, again, we're 2023, April 23, some interesting times headed our way, loss of uh, lack of liquidity in the market, all kinds of distress popping up here and there. Advice for somebody who is not a passive investor, who is not considered investing in real estate before, but is thinking about it now, what advice would you give them? Um, I would say is you want to make sure that you're investing in a great sponsor like Alliance. You want to know, you really want to understand, am I investing in a solutionary, solutionary oriented company like Alliance? I'll tell you why. Anyone can pay you a preferred return, okay? Every quarter, it's easy. Drop in your bank account, there's all different ways to do it. But when there's a challenge that arises, I want to know how do you solve that challenge? As tough times don't last, tough people do. And when you can rise to a challenge, that's who I bet on. Because you know what? The one who's going to make me money over a long period of time is the one that's going to show up and be able to solve challenges. That's what I advise anyone. Because a lot of people ask me about inv investing in different things and who I invest in. The number one question I ask a sponsor is, how do you solve problems? Because the person that solves problems, I'll, I'll ride that horse all the way into the sunset. Because I know life's not perfect. I know deals aren't perfect. But if you have experience, look at our leadership team, 200 plus years of experience, solutionary oriented, doesn't get better than that. That's why people invest with Alliance. Ben Reinberg, founder, CEO, I hope I got all your titles, right? Alliance Consolidated Group of Companies. What? First of all, an enormous pleasure working with you, an enormous pleasure becoming a friend, yes. and an enormous pleasure having you on the podcast. Thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you. What a pleasure, and I uh, really enjoyed myself, and thanks for having me on. All right, that was Ben Reinberg of Alliance Consolidated Group of Companies. As I told you in the introduction, you can see now he is a really inspirational, very positive outlook guy on life and on business and always looking out for the people around him. Just a super nice guy. Ben, thank you so very much for joining me today on the podcast. It was an enormous pleasure having you on the podcast and it is an absolute joy and privilege working with you. Thank you so much. And I do like our early morning calls as well, by the way, <laughs> just in case you were wondering. I know you weren't wondering, but I do like them. Uh, they, uh, they get me in the right frame of mind for whatever's going on each day. And thank you too, uh, dear listeners, for joining us today. I hope you found Ben's insights and thoughts and general attitude to life as inspirational and as encouraging as I did. That's it for this week's podcast. Thank you so very much, everybody. I will see you next time. And in the meantime, this is Adam Gower signing off.